started, I discovered that we have in our audience at least two people who haven't seen the show. Are, are most of you house watchers or, okay, the, the, the avid fans are here, I see. Um, for those who haven't watched the show, Gregory House is a doctor who is a extract diagnostician. He does diagnostic medicine and he has three doctors working with him, um, Dr. Chase, Dr. Cameron, and Dr. Foreman as his assistants and the people who ask the questions that presumably we, the TV viewing audience, would ask so that he can explain and be brilliant. And he's really brilliant and he's also um, impressed with his own brilliance and he's uh, not terribly nice. And he's also a drug addict. So this is the doctor that you want to call. You know, definitely the guy. But uh, in all of these shows, he comes up with something incredible at the end. Uh, the day is saved. Actually, there's a couple of episodes where the day is not saved, but mostly the day is saved. And in the course of getting there, there are many detours through various diseases that um, mostly aren't that, that common, I don't think. You know, and you've probably seen on medical shows before where they say something like, when you see X, think horses, not zebras. They would tell that to medical students. Well, it's all zebras all the time, it seems like, on house. So anyway, uh, it's a great show. It's a very entertaining. It's on its fourth season, which starts next Tuesday night. Uh, so we're going to just look at shows from the first three seasons. And this is a very common thing that we do in science study break. We look at TV shows, we look at movies, and we bring in somebody who feels like they're just they're just itching to talk about them. We've had people come and talk about uh, the TV show 24 when they had the bioterrorism season. We had someone come and talk about phylogenetic analysis and crime solving uh, using an episode of CSI. We've had people talk about climate change in movies like The Day After Tomorrow. Or we've had uh, people talk about drugs and a scanner darkly. So we're always looking for suggestions. At the end of the show, you'll notice that there's a form in your chair Please fill it out. If there's a show that uh, you'd like to see us tackle or a movie that you'd like to see us tackle, let us know. I will say that if you want to see us tackle Lost, tell me how to do it, okay? <laughs> tell, tell me what it is that, that could be, that's the topic that could be addressed, because there's a lot of calls for Lost, but I don't quite know what the scientific end would be there. My impression is it's kind of paranormal. So, so let me know. If you want Lost, then you get to be an assistant producer. Okay, my name is Roxanne Bogutska, and I'm a science instruction librarian here at the Life Science Library. And today, to help us with Lost, uh, with Lost, bleh, with House, we have Dr. Leanne Field, who is a distinguished senior lecturer in the School of Biological Sciences here, and an adjunct associate professor at the UT School of Public Health. Dr. Field began her career at the Centers for Disease Control as a microbiologist in 1972 and has had an ongoing professional interest in infectious disease and public health ever since that time. She joined the faculty here at UT Austin in 1997 and enthusiastically teaches courses to undergraduate students in medical microbiology, human infectious diseases, and emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. She also directs the Public Health Internship Program here, which gives undergraduate and post-baccalaureate students the opportunity to explore careers in public health by conducting research projects in epidemiology or laboratory science at the Texas Department of State Health Services and the Austin Travis County Health and Human Services Department. She's very busy. She's also the director of the Clinical Laboratory Science Program at the university and the faculty director of two undergraduate students' organizations, the Society of Public Health Students and Students in Clinical Laboratory Science. Dr. Field has been happily married for 33 years to her husband, Mike, and she has one daughter, Grace, who is a senior at Rice University, majoring in voice and opera studies. So as part of the fall's first science study break, when we are honored to be part of Natural Sciences Week, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lamb. Good afternoon, all these great snacks, and I'm so happy to be here uh, to set the stage to go through some of these couple of house episodes. <clears throat> uh, get back up to the front. Oh, open it up. Uh, I'm going to give you about a seven or eight or nine minute primer on 
uh, emerging infectious diseases <coughs> and our body's defenses. So get ready to zoom through this. If you like it, you can come and take uh, human infectious diseases with me. All right, this is the war within us. That is the microbes versus our um, host defenses. And I love this book by Cedric Mims. Oh, there you go. Thank you. All right, let's go back. There it is, the war within us. All right, it's the microbe versus the human host. Sometimes we win, sometimes the microbe wins and kills the host, and always the battle between them is always part of the collateral damage to the body. Infectious diseases are the number one cause of death in the world and number three cause in the U.S., and here are listed some of the uh, top infectious diseases worldwide. All right, what do the pathogens, the disease-causing microbes, bring to the table? Well, most of the case, most of the time, they are not pathogenic. There's only around a thousand that can cause disease of the trillions of microbes, and not all pathogens are created equal. We have rather benign ones, like I'm suffering from right now, the common cold, or we have the deadly viruses that will kill you called Ebola and others. And here is a great quote from a Nobel laureate. Here we are, here are the bugs. They are looking for food, we are their meat. They reproduce so quickly, how do we compete? They have enormous potential for genetic change and their tools for adaptation far outpace ours. But, with rare exceptions, our microbial adversaries have a shared interest in our survival. Almost any pathogen reaches a dead end when it kills the host. True severe pathogen-host interactions would eliminate both species. We are the contingent survivors of such encounters because of the shared interest. Joshua Letterberg. So, what do the pathogens want to do in us? To get in, find the safe niche, multiply and reach the next host. How do they do this? There's a number of ways they're transmitted and you can look for methods of transmission in-house. Respiratory spread, fecal oral, poopy in the mouth, <laughs> venereal spread, and then a number of infectious diseases transmitted from animal to man and we call those zoonoses. Here is us in a nutshell and most of the microbes get in on one of the internal surfaces of the body because the skin is very, very tough to get into. Once they get in, they attach, they begin to multiply, and some, but not all, can invade deeper into the body, and they must exit the host, or they're not successful. They have to get in, multiply, get out to the next host, or they're uh, eliminated. All right, that's the offense. Let's look at the defense. Our incredible, and it is our incredible immune system. Here we are in a sea of microbes surrounding us. The good news is not many of us will get sick. If we sprayed something in this room right now, we all breathed it in, only the tip of the iceberg would come down with disease. That's because our immune systems are so good. Our body, the castle, this is the analogy I use. We have layers of defense including physical barriers and some incredible white blood cells, the phagocytes that are designed to eat and kill, and the incredible lymphocytes that make a tailor-made response and leave those memory cells behind to fight another day. Three levels of defenses at the surface, right underneath the surface, and then the immune system defenses. So what about our body surfaces? They're well defended, whether it's the skin, the conjunctiva of the eye, the lungs, the gastrointestinal tract, or the genitourinary tract, these are all dynamic environments. They're designed to move the pathogens out of the body. Here's a look at those internal mucous membranes inside the body. If the microbes breach the defenses, you get the phagocytes, the eating and killing machines designed to kill them. This is a quote from George Bernard Shaw. There's generally only one scientific treatment for all diseases. That is to stimulate phagocytes. It's not true for all diseases, but it is true for bacterial diseases, and House features a lot of bacterial diseases on their program. Here are just some beautiful pictures of the phagocytes reaching out to that tiny microbe on the bottom. Don't feel sorry for the microbe. They have defenses. 
Here's a macrophage, or neutrophil, sorry, uh, eating uh, a group of bacteria. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Such an incredible story. So bacteria are taken in, they're ingested, they're digested, and they're spit out the other side. That's it, in a nutshell. So these phagocytes are circulating around in the blood, but that does no good if you cut your arm. You have to deliver them to the site of the infection via the process of inflammation an incredible process where the blood vessels in the local area of the infection dilate and the phagocytes squeeze out and move to the site of the microbes. Again, this is all for bacterial diseases. Viruses, we have different defenses. These are the classic signs of inflammation known since the time of the Greeks. Redness, swelling, heat, and pain. Here's some pictures of inflammation. Okay, this is a good sign. If you didn't have this, it would mean your defenses were not working. Here's what your throat looks like. And take a look at that white stuff, which is what? Pus, 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 pus. Pus means, we'll come back to that in just a minute. Here's your ear infection, otitis media. This is pus. It's the well-known product of infection and inflammation, the stuff of boils and abscesses. It contains bacteria, both dead and alive, the phagocytes, and the fluid debris from the battlefield. We see it less common today, but it means when you see it, the phagocytes are in there working, and they are doing their best. In the old days, it was called laudable, praiseworthy pus. Now, also a feature of house is you will notice that Many people that get bacterial infections, they do not get a fever. Well, I'm here to tell you that anytime there is a local inflammatory response, there will be a fever because the cytokines that are released travel to the brain and will set the temperature up to try to increase the inflammation and to limit the spread of the infection. If this doesn't work to contain the pathogens, we bring in seven to 10 days later lagging behind in time the lymphocytes that make that tailor-made response to leave the memory cells behind. Here's some just beautiful pictures of lymphocytes circulating around. They circulate around the body in the lymphatic and in the blood system, and each lymphocyte recognizes only one shape on the surface of a pathogen. And the battle with the lymphocyte occurs in the lymph node, shown here in green, defending the lungs. So when a lymphocyte meets the particular pathogen with a shape on the surface, it is cloned. It becomes activated here, showing lymphocyte number two, begins to divide and differentiate into the cells that will take out the pathogen and left behind will be long-lived memory cells. How do the lymphocytes take out the pathogen? Either coating it with antibody and then those eat and kill phagocytes do it in or they blow it up uh, a virus-infected cell. And memory cells are left behind, which is why we vaccinate people so that you've seen it before and the next time you see it, the infection will be fought very, very quickly. So those are our defenders. Surface defenses, the phagocytes, and the lymphocytes. Now when you think about immunology, and you'll see this in house, there are normal immune responses there. <coughs> There are immunodeficiency diseases, and in that case, these are genetic uh, inborn diseases, and what will happen to the person if they have an immunodeficiency disease? Will they be able to make this response? No, they will have a defect. Can you cause someone to be immunodeficient? Yeah. Radiation, chemotherapy, Cortisone, all of these things will suppress the immune response and the give tip the hand up for the microbes. Another possibility is hypersensitivity, an exaggerated response, that's your allergic response, and then the autoimmune response, the response against self. We certainly don't want that. So when we think about uh, genetic uh, immunodeficiencies, we can have problems with the phagocytes. And you're going to uh, see that in one of these house episodes. He talks about a particular uh, phagocytic defect. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Or we can have defects in the lymphocytes, in the B cells that make antibody, the T cells that kill virus-infected cells, 
or the both, and there's the, the boy and the bubble. You can't live without both of them, and that's called severe combined immunodeficiency or skin disease. Okay? And we're going to start out, I think, our clips with a picture of the, uh, with a clip of the allergic responses. So I just wanted to kind of go through and let you know you're going to have an antibody involved, and it's going to bind to these cells called mast cells that are the, from the tip of your head to the bottom of your feet. The allergic moiety will cross-link these antibodies, and the mast cells will degranulate and release what? Histamine, okay? So think about what histamine does, and we will see the effects of it in just a minute. Okay, Roxanne, that's your little primer in immunology and infectious diseases. <laughs> Anybody know what was happening to him? Anaphylaxis, right? The most severe form of an allergic response to the anti-venom, okay? And uh, the interesting thing about that, I'm sure these are rare reactions, but any kind of uh, type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, you have to be primed for it. So the first time you are exposed to the bee, if it stings you, uh, it's free. The second time and subsequent times you're going to have an allergic response. Can it happen that fast? I counted about four seconds there. More like 30 seconds to a minimum, uh, to a minute would be a minimum there, but yes, that's why it's called immediate anaphylaxis. So that's a pretty accurate re representation and he has trouble breathing. Snake bite guy is way more interesting. Gross, actually. So, just so that we can, you know, part of house that's uh, the entertaining part for some of us is that, there, is that there's always something gross every episode. <laughs> so, here's the grossness. Remember, there was a picture she showed you of redness and what have you. This isn't quite the same because. Uh, well, it's beyond that. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is the microbes winning on that leg. Everyone had enough of this image? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Okay, so they talk about giving him the epinephrine after he had that reaction to the antivenin, and then you get the glorious technicolor shot of the wound. Right, so does anybody know how epinephrine helps an allergic response? That's exactly, so they're right, that's what they would do. What happens in the allergic response, anybody know, in systemic anaphylaxis? And the blood vessels begin to open up in response to that histamine, and plasma pours into the tissues, and that causes the blood pressure to drop, the heart will stop, and the, the, there's also smooth muscle contraction of the bronchioles so that the person cannot breathe. So they must put in the epinephrine to reverse those effects, and then add the plasma back to expand the blood and restore blood pressure. So all that's really pretty accurate. What we're going to do is show some things that are accurate and some things that are not so accurate. So he responded to the epinephrine and he was just fine, and that's the way it would happen. Yes? So what happened to the leg, though? What happened to the leg? We're going to continue on with the story of the leg. So this is a little... Yeah. So he got supposedly bit by a snake. Mm -hmm. Okay. I did neglect to tell you that. So they looked at him and they detected two puncture wounds and they figured it must be a snake bite. And they got with the um, parks, park ranger type people to go out. That's where the first clip you saw them holding up the timber rattler. So they gave him the antivenin, and that wasn't working out. So what they've done between that clip and this clip is given him some uh, different antivenin, and they've stood by with, uh, cortisone. with cortisone so that if he had another reaction, they could help. So they gave him that new stuff. He didn't, thankfully, have another reaction. And, however... <laughs> Or if I'm allergic again, so you can speak really here. You have a reaction. Ready to do 
whatever's necessary to ensure your airways stay open and your heart keeps beating. My life's on the way in. Can't this wait? not having a reaction. Then the next thing that happens is... <laughs> okay. so, His condition is not improving. However... The dose is already due. There's another anti that's affected. We've already tried it. The first step is that he was allergic to. Gave it to him with high-dose steroids. Nothing's working. What does it all mean? Wrong. So, what does it all mean? Okay. They're pretty much ignoring the leg, right? <laughs> Nobody's talking about the leg. Does he look like he has a fever or is acutely ill? No, okay, with that kind of wound, he would be in excruciating pain. Did he look like he was in pain? He's talking about, well, that was quite sore here. Okay. So that is not really very realistic. So what does it mean? Let's see the next clip. Okay. You're done. <laughs> This is a really good hours. There's nothing we can do except deal with the pain. Now, is that true? Well, I need to go home. You're not going home. What will I do? What will happen to my dog? The necklace, please. No, I don't. Wait, wait, wait. The guy's dying and all he cares about is his dog. So 
they said the dog is not susceptible because he has natural antibodies, and they're talking about diagnosing it by culturing the dog's saliva. There would be many, many, many different things in that dog's saliva, so that, uh, that is not an accurate uh, method of diagnosis at all. Uh, now, what else did they say, Roxanne, about it? Let's see. Oh, your leg might have to be amputated. That is definitely true. Okay, if the flesh-eating strep got into that uh, leg, you could be dead in 48 hours. So again, it causes a very, very excruciating pain. It's a, one of the most painful skin and soft tissue infections, and this man appears to be in no particular stress. So that's not quite realistic. Morphe? Okay. Okay. One of the best things about getting to work with Dr. Field on this is that I discovered a new game. Okay, it's the house game. It's actually not a drinking game. It is a using a library database game, which may not immediately thrill you, but the deal is there are two really great library databases that are perfect to call up on your laptop when you're watching house. And one of them is because they're always going to throw out all these diseases and all these names, right? And you can look them up right away in Gale Virtual Reference Library. This database is a bunch of encyclopedias, basically, that used to be on the shelf in print, but now they're here. And so you can just look up flesh-eating disease and quickly find out just a little primer on flesh-eating disease. It describes it, talks about the symptoms, how it's diagnosed, what the prognosis is, just, just the basic stuff. You know, so this is really great. So you can play along with house, you know. So now you look at the symptoms, take it all down, and then go to a database and say, I think it's this, you know, and then you can, you know, or you can, or you can like check it, you know. When he's saying, oh, first we think it's this thing or something, go into Gale Virtual Reference Library and check up on it. So this is no, cool. Notice under treatment, it says rapid aggressive medical treatment, specifically antibiotic therapy. And a couple of clips previous, you know, house said you're dying, there's nothing we can do for you. So, well, poor guy, you know, be under house's care. That's all I can say. <laughs> okay, let's see. Now, we're ready to proceed to. Right, um, stay tuned while we do a little technical backing here. Four things, a little switching. Right so, how many people watch house regularly? Okay, good. So they're supposed to get a new resident on the fourth season. I'm kind of anxious to see how that goes, right? Foreman is going away, is that right? Mm -hmm. Oh, all three of them, they're starting over. Okay, well, it'll be interesting. Three new people he can abuse, basically. So how many had seen that episode? People remember that one? Okay. They had these other three, remember the other two patients? One of them was was uh, a, a volleyball chick, right? That's what they called her too, they called her volleyball chick. And then the third one was House. For those of you who don't watch the show, uh, Dr. House walks with a woman. And it was explained to us in, oh good, it's here. It was explained to us how that came about. In general, I think the first uh, season of House is more accurate than each season that on a little more spectacular uh, than, the, than the last. So. This episode is from season three. We're kind of jumping around. That one was season one that we just saw. It's called Three Stories. This one's called Quack-a-Mole, and it's from season three. And I really like it because it has Patrick Fuji in it. <laughs> so I was pretty happy about this. But here is the clip. Wait a minute. Let me pause this for a minute to tell you what's going on. Okay. In this one, this kid... Patrick Fugit, you have to do this when I say his name. Patrick Fugit uh, works at some like Chuck E. Cheese pizza birthday and he's working one night when a bunch of kids come in for a birthday. Also, his younger brother and sister are there because their parents have died and he is now their guardian and their sole support. So he's bringing out the big birthday cake when all of a sudden, and he's singing the little happy birthday song that they sing at this, at this pizza parlor when he starts, you know, the, the television shorthand that they use for things are getting hazy, you're getting sick, you know, the camera's doing like this and stuff. And then he runs over to the table, clutches his stomach, and just heaves all over the birthday cake, okay? Um, and that was the gross part for that episode, but we're not showing it. Um, but I can show you later if you want. So anyway, and then he clutches his chest and he falls to the floor, and the next thing you know, they're shocking him back bringing him back, and they're saying we have a heartbeat, and they're taking him to Princeton, Plainsboro Hospital, which is where 
Plus works, and so they've been trying to figure out what's wrong with this 18-year-old kid that he was barking and he had a heart attack and he's got all these problems. And they've been doing a variety of tests. House likes to not take anything seriously, and so he told each of his attending doctors that they could each do one test and they each had an out. So they've all gone off and done their various tests and they've come back. And now, Please, stop doing that. You almost finished. Stop osteomyelitis. And Jerome Buffon toxins. And? You can stop too. It's syphilis. You sure? It's good to find out. He's also positive for Aikinoa. Why are you two screwed up? No. A uh, chance. Second than we thought. Finish that test. It should be impossible to get two right answers to one question. It's okay to have three. Apparently. He's supposed to do botulism too. So we knock down one infection and three more pop up. I think this game is rigged. <laughs> okay. Okay, what a mix of infections. Okay, osteomyelitis, which is what? Infection of bone, okay, syphilis. Iconella, which is known for uh, an infection you get if you have a fist fight and someone knocks you in the jaw. And then he also has botulism, okay? Anybody know what the symptoms of botulism are? This kid doesn't have them. You seen the kid, yeah. Right, so double vision first and then ascending paralysis until it would hit the breathing apparatus and you would have to go on a respirator or that would be it, lights out, okay? So would they be seeing microorganisms under, first of all, it's amazing that they do all their own testing, right? <laughs> These residents, they are experts in every lab test. They also run the MRI and all this complicated equipment. So that is not realistic. And uh, this bewildering array of symptoms is uh, highly improbable, okay? System, but now he's having seizures every few hours. But they don't tell Scott, you. Not immunocompromised. <laughs> <laughs> no, what count was normal and he was negative for a job. Well, he's not immunocompromised. Why is he acting like he's immunocompromised? What do the seizures tell us? Nothing. There were no structural abnormalities on the CT, not focal neuro exam, no electrolyte imbalance, nothing. What do unexplained seizures and really sick 18 year olds have in common? You think in trouble? I'm thinking drugs. He's an admitted user. Drugs crash his immune system. Tox-free was clean. Clean tox-free means there's no drugs in his blood or urine. There can still be drugs trapped in his fat cells from the good old days. If they're in his fat, why would they be affecting him now? The keen observer would notice that he's had some digestive issues lately. His weight loss could burn out fat cells and release the drugs back into his system. There's no way to know. It's impossible to test fat cells with drugs. It's not impossible to make him lose more weight. You want us to stop it so we can drive him into another seizure, maybe a heart attack, just so we can run another <coughs> That'd be cruel. Just sweat it out of him. I haven't touched the thing since the moment my parents died. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what do you think about this? Could you sweat out drugs in a sauna? Can you test for drugs and sweat? Well, actually, the answer is yes. And I uh, contacted Dr. George Kublow down at UT Health Science Center in San Antonio. They have a forensic toxicology program. So I emailed him, and he responded back that yes, indeed, uh, you could have a number of drugs of abuse that uh, could be stored in fat. They would first, however, be released into the bloodstream and then they may also appear in sweat. So this sounds far out, but it's not that far off with reality. Okay, so we give them a check for that. But they should have been able to detect it in like 
they should have been able to, well, but they said that it, it was old drugs that had been stored in fat. So he wasn't presently taking drugs, so he might not have had them in his blood or urine. Okay? I understand this system a long time. supposed to be ill with three or four different types of infections looks remarkably healthy and uh, he doesn't appear to have a fever or any other uh, symptoms except he's perplexed and house is planned to spray him with microorganisms <laughs> and uh, he should be perplexed right and the idea that you would infect someone with different uh, strains of bacteria and he's throwing in the rhinovirus and they would uh, so whichever one won out, he would get the, those symptoms. Uh, absurd is the only word I can use. <laughs> okay. Um, this turns out to be, uh, at one point there was a, when House was with them and the, and the whiteboard and the things, they were throwing out the names of different diseases. I don't know if you remember that, but do you have any idea what it turns out to, to be that he had? Any, any guesses on what, it, what he winds up with? If only. He winds up with something called chronic granulomatous disease, and I'm not going to go back to the other uh, to the other laptop to show you, but remember Gale Virtual Reference Library and how we looked up flesh-eating bacteria? Well, you can look up CGD, chronic granulomatous disease, in there as well, and you'll get to see a bunch of things about it, including... Mm -hmm. Including that it would present in uh, young childhood infants and young children, so it's a, it's a genetic defect in the phagocytic cells, they have trouble in that inflammatory process squeezing out of the blood vessels and making it to the actual tissue where the infection is, and then they're able to engulf bacteria, 
but they're missing a key enzyme so they cannot kill them. But the idea that this 18 year old could have had this disease for 18 years because he grew up in a suburban bubble, he would not have uh, displayed the symptoms of that. Again, it's absolutely absurd. So now, and I know we're, we're just whipping right through these, but there's, there's so much house goodness to talk about. So now we're in season two, and this is the dramatic two-parter. And so I'm guessing maybe part one was like before that, before that Christmas hiatus when all the shows go off and you just get the old stuff. Yeah. Okay, in this one called Euphoria, uh, this gentleman here on the bed, the patient, is a police officer, and it opens with him chasing someone down an alley and uh, then the person seems to disappear. Well, they've jumped into a big trash bin. So he gets that person to jump out, and he, he's holding a gun on them, and he, you know, but he's, but he's laughing like a loon, okay? The cop, not, not the suspect. And the suspect's very confused by this behavior, and uh, the cop isn't really on his game, so eventually the suspect's able to pull out a gun and shoot him. Well, it, it, it bounces somehow off of some metal. He's got Kevlar on, but there's metal here too, and it, the bullet breaks, and it comes up and it hits him and he's lying there and the suspect runs away and this guy's lying there in the street bleeding that movie blood and laughing like crazy. So uh, they have brought him into the hospital because this is not the normal reaction, among other things. And he's been shot. <laughs> so they want to know what might have caused this to happen to him and they're asking him things about his environment. Just ask him if he was exposed to anything insanitary. <laughs> the foreman has gone to look at his house. These people are always like doing home invasions to look at the, the patients' houses. This is the gross stuff for this episode. <laughs> Encyclopedia Brown Mysteries, you know, it's all here. It's all there. Everything that you need to know. You never know. Alice goes to the police station while Dorman is examining the guy's phone. What's your partner said? Police is a cesspool, but I don't think I need to test for anything. Nope. Wasted time. Since he was admitted, why don't we agree to disagree? 
Actually, why don't we agree that you'll disagree with me while treating him for legionnaires? Sounds pithy, but... Okay, so once again, Gill Virtual Reference Library. Uh, it's a pain to switch back and forth between the laptops, but... When, after I finished talking to you, I ran to that database and I looked up Legionnaire's disease. And anybody, I, uh, anybody know anything about Legionnaire's disease? Yes, sir. It comes from stagnant cold water. It comes, the bacteria, right? It's an environmental reservoir and it's usually associated with large air conditioning units. I haven't ever seen it associated with a window unit like you saw there. It's usually part of the uh, big condensing uh, pools, as you said. Uh, the organisms are living in the water. The original outbreak was uh, among American uh, Legionnaire attendees uh, during 1976 in Philadelphia, hence the name Legionnaire's disease. <coughs> what kind of disease is it? He's told us the source. What would you, uh, what kind of infectious disease? Bacterial infection. Bacterial infection, yes, it is a bacterium. Legionella pneumophila, good. Okay, what kind of disease would, you, what would the symptoms be? saw some, the, one of the policemen over there was coughing, right? So it's one of the, uh, it's a cause of community acquired pneumonia, okay? Notice House didn't do anything about the, the uh, other cop there who was uh, uh, showing symptoms and uh, you'll see that uh, the person that uh, he is taking care of doesn't appear to be coughing uh, so far. And so they've jumped to the conclusion that he has uh, Legionnaire's disease. Is it contagious? Can you spread it person to person? No, you can't. You have to have an environmental reservoir. Another source of Legionnaire's disease has been uh, the supermarket produce section where they spray the mist on the vegetables and people have breathed that type of uh, mist containing the organism and come down with this form of pneumonia. Okay? So he's right, House is right, it could be that except not from a window air condition. So between this part right here and the next part that we're going to see, this cute Dr. Foreman gets sick. He starts laughing at everything, and so they wind up putting him in an isolation place, and they put Joe, the cop, in, in an isolation room as well. And uh, suddenly they seem like really, really motivated to solve this. It's kind of not a good you know, statement about doctors, but they get all of a sudden real motivated. And Dr. Cameron goes back to the house to gather more samples, back to Joe's apartment, to gather more samples to see if maybe they missed something, because now they're going to rerun these tests. And? I feel a lot better. I could do to make you hate it. And House catches her at it. He told her not to go. Yeah, okay. oh, 
fungus enters the brain through the spinoidal sinus where it dances its triple threat of happiness, blindness, and intractable pain. Well, let's hope this experience teaches our cop a lesson. Don't cut corners when you're growing your pot. See you back home. <laughs> okay, anybody know anything about cryptococcus, cryptococcus neoformans? Okay, this is a yeast, very, very uh, serious, uh, dissimilar fungal infection. Now, I'm not sure about his symptoms. Did you want to look cryptococcus uh, up in the... Uh, Reference, so they're trying to account for blindness, uh, euphoria, laughing, all of these would indicate something's in uh, the brain. None of those symptoms fit with Legionnaire's disease, so that's kind of a little incongruous. So the thing to do would be to go and look up the symptoms of cryptococcus uh, neoformans, the cause of cryptococcosis. And we have uncommanded shutdown, so... Oh, we're having a technical problem. We're having a technical problem, okay. yes. You know, it's so, too good to last, so. But it, once again, was something that uh, I was able to find in the Gale Virtual Reference Library. And I looked up crypto, Cryptococcus neoformans and found an article on Cryptococcosis, okay, that had the same lovely format of, describe, of definition and then the symptoms and the prognosis and the treatment and all of that, as well as some references to other things to, to look at. And uh, the diagnosis for this, which they never get to, would be a lumbar puncture in order to recover it from the spinal fluid. Okay. So uh, again, they're not quite right on with their diagnosis. They are right in that it has an environmental reservoir and it is associated with uh, pigeons and bird droppings. And what's funny about that is like every week, I mean, we lay bets on it, you know, house comes on and people come in and they've got like cuts and gaping wounds and the, and the staff is all like, let's do an LP, you know, a lumbar <laughs> puncture. That's their answer to everything. And then this yeah, one time, this, when it would be a problem, <laughs> when it would have been the thing to do, you know. They're not doing it. Yeah. So go figure. So we go to another clip. We are. We're going to move into part two of... Uh, of euphoria, and what happens here is that the, the guy Joe, the cop, he's really, really sick. He's, he's dead, actually, he dies, uh, in horrible pain, intractable pain. And uh, Foreman is in the isolation room with him, observing this and knowing that his disease will also progress in this way and that he will face this pain as well. And so, which that kind of pain is not associated with Legionnaire's disease, nor is it associated with uh, cryptococcus. Mm -hmm. So these are kind of some unusual sets of symptoms that I couldn't match up with anything I know about. Mm -hmm. Listeria. I know that cut off a little soon, but the answer is listeria is what House said. Okay, so uh, do you remember what I told you about the lymphocyte response and the immune <coughs> system response? 
only one particular shape on a lymphocyte would be uh, would recognize the pathogen and the cells would begin to multiply and make your response to produce antibodies. So House is claiming here that uh, the first infection you'd be making an antibody response and the second infection would get caught in the crossfire by the antibody response. And that's not true because the lymphocytes are it's like making a tailor-made suit of clothes you're only going to make a response to that one pathogen, and it will not cross-protect you against a totally unrelated pathogen. So finally, a little more detective work. <laughs> Um, this was a race between House running to, uh, back to Joe's apartment to look for what could be possibly causing this, and they were standing by, meanwhile, at the hospital. Cameron, Dr. Cameron was Dr. Foreman's medical proxy, and they were standing by because they were going to find out by doing this brain biopsy. Uh, so House was racing to try to get this before they had to cut open Foreman's head, but they did it anyway. Okay, so... Uh, the diagnostic test for primary amoebic meningoencephalitis would be cerebral spinal fluid or lumbar puncture, and you would see the organisms multiplying in the spinal fluid. The whole premise of this show was they had to do a brain biopsy uh, in order to diagnose it. And uh, you'll also notice that, uh, what did she say they could do for the infection? So it's a protozoan infection. What did she say? Anti-parasitic drug. This infection is 100% fatal. Okay. And you're dealing, they're, they're contrasting a lung infection with Legionella and the glaria, which would be in the cerebral spinal fluid and up in the brain, and uh, claiming that there's a connection there between them. All right, yes, you would breathe in the Legionella if the guy is, you know, potentially growing his marijuana, and he saw that misty, moisty, uh, uh, the way he was um, uh, kind of irrigating, and you could get that way. You could get Legionella that way. You might breathe in the glaria if they were in the contaminated water, but it would go to the lungs, right? It would not go up to the brain. The way that this infection of primary anemic meningoencephalitis is always contracted is by what? Nose. through the nose and it's diving into stagnant water so you have to forcefully force the water up the nose and it crosses the cribriform plate and goes immediately into the central nervous system this is extremely rare we have had actually two cases <coughs> in Austin in the last few months here is the most recent one this one is dated September 8th. 
So back in the summer, we had a, a, a young man at a summer camp who was diving in Lake LBJ. He contracted it, was taken to Chil uh, Dale Children's Hospital and died. This was a man at the same lake who also contracted it by diving and he also died. It's 100% fatal. So the idea that you could somehow give him an antiparasitic drug and he'd be just fine you know, does not line up with reality. Okay? Usually it's associated with diving into stagnant ponds with mud on the bottom. They are hypothesizing that perhaps all the rain we had this summer maybe stirred up the mud in these lakes. Normally the lakes are so uh, there's so much movement of water that you would not expect Megalaria uh, to, from swimming in the lake. But this kind of makes you think. Uh, here it is right in our own backyard. So, okay. What we have here is a database called StatRef. And I just went from the library's main page under research tools. There's databases and indexes to articles, and it's just under the S's. And it's a collection of medical texts. And so I just typed in primary amoeba, amoeba stuff and searched it, and uh, there were like seven or eight um, entries from different textbooks, medical textbooks that came up, and I picked this one. Uh, and you can see how it's talking about exactly what she said, how this is contracted, not necessarily by standing next to some water that's Mystic. doing this business, you know, but by diving so that the water's forced up uh, into the nose. And so you can use this as well to check on Dr. House when they talk about how something happens, maybe a person could contract that, although as you said, he died. But uh, he would have been dead way before two episodes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like 70 hours. It's very, very fast. That young man that contracted it was dead in just a couple of days. Yeah. Very fast. But here you can check on things like the mode of transmission, the methods of control, so that if part of what they're saying is right, a person could catch disease, could get disease A, but could they get it this way? So here's another source for checking up on house. So next uh, next Tuesday night, the show starts season four. I think it's eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. So fire up your laptops, go to the library main page, and use our databases so that you know. And then you can, and then you can, you know, write those letters that are fun to write to the network saying, well, actually, <laughs> I checked it, you know? Okay, any, any questions other, or comments? Any other questions? Yes? Um, well, this is, instance isn't realistic. Does uh, this sort of thing ever occur where two infections battle each other within the body? Is, is, has a tropism for the central nervous system. The other one is in the lungs, and they wouldn't even be close to each other in the body. And the antibodies and the immune response really can't fight well up in the brain because uh, it's not well defended. Well, uh, I'm just saying, if, like, if there were two infections in like the same place, does, same it, place. It, uh, does it ever occur where like two infections in the body do actually fight each other like they were suggesting. Right. The question is, would two infections in the body uh, be fighting against each other? No. The immune system would be fighting both of them at the same time. So um, Roxanne showed me that if you want to buy the DVDs, which is what we did, and watch all of the house episodes, they're all summarized on Wikipedia. <laughs> and so we just went down and picked out the episodes that had to do with infectious diseases. And uh, so it's really been a lot of fun. And so uh, I hope this perks your interest in uh, infectious disease and the topic of microbiology. Um, consider me a, a, a living reference. If you have any other questions in the future, uh, just shoot me an email and I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you. That's pretty much what we have, but before you go, please fill out the, oh, please applaud. Yes, yes, please welcome. Yes, yes. She worked so hard on this program, and she educated me so much. So I laid on the couch and watched about 13,000. <laughs> <laughs> also, on your chair was a pencil and a, and a form, and if you would just let us know what you think about the program. Let us know what programs you would like us to do in the future, and uh, give me the secret to Lost, okay? Uh, fill that out and just leave it in your chair with your pencil, and uh, take more snacks.